bring them down here and um, use the five minutes of introduction to kind of make my announcements and things like that. So let me let me share my screen. And then I will introduce Nia and Nia will introduce you, Tim. Um, all right. So welcome everyone. Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for Husky Bites. Uh, it is wonderful to be here on a Monday evening with you. Uh, it is middle of March in Houghton, Michigan. And this is a um, webinar series that is sponsored by the College of Engineering. I'm the Dean of the College of Engineering. My name is Janet Callahan. And I've added my email so that people can find me if you wanna um, send me a correspondence, feel free to just drop me a note. It's wonderful to hear from our future students and from our parents of current students and from our um, alumni. Uh, and so um, thanks, thanks so much for joining us this evening. I want to acknowledge um, this evening's sponsor who is Eloise Holler, who is a friend of Michigan Tech. Thank you so much, Eloise, for um, sponsoring this evening's Husky Bites. So um, thank you to the Gregories, to Michael and Karen Gregory, who have um, who are matching dollar for dollar up to $25,000 of gifts to the Michigan Tech Annual Scholarship Fund, which is um, where um, our giving is directed um, for this evening. So if, if a person sponsors Husky Bites, um, the, their sponsorship dollars, 100% of them go in support of student scholarship. So here's where we are on the, on the thermometer that's measuring where we are relative to the matching fund. And, and I just wanna thank so many people for giving $6,600. We've got six more sessions left and that's about, I don't know what, $19,000. So we've, we're gonna to have to have some major gifts to meet this. And I hope the Gregory's will extend the range of the goal to fall if, if, we, don't, um, if we don't meet it this spring. So in order to give, um, just go to the give now button. So www.mtu.edu backslash give now. Um, and then indicate annual fund scholarships. Um, type in Husky Bytes so we know that you did it. And, and also it, it's helpful if you drop a quick email to engineering at mtu.edu so that if you want your gift acknowledged, um, we can do that. Um, so um, I do wanna call out World Water Day. Uh, and so there's a series of events that starts March 18th, which is just three days from now. Uh, uh, at uh, Brave Blue World facilitated discussion with Nancy Langston and Casey Huckins as part of the sustainability film series. Then there is a community art show. Um, our own Husky Bites next week will we'll feature special guest Andrew Bernard at the Great Lakes Research Center. And uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. And then we have a youth speaker on March 23rd. It's Art Night on March 23rd, 6 to 7 p.m. Uh, and again, the theme is World Water Day. And then on March 24th, there's a World Water Day panel. So I just want you all to know about that and to learn more or to, to find this in the lineup, um, just go to mtu.edu great backslash Great Lakes backslash about backslash World Water Day or just Google it. Um, so thank you. Welcome again to the K-12 educators. Um, and so if you are joining us, you're a K-12 educator, just make sure Danielle knows about that by sending an email to engineering at mtu.edu because we can verify your, your attendance here this evening. And if you are a Michigan, if you know a Michigan Tech teacher who might want to get some professional development credit, please um, pass on Husky Bites because there's a lot of things that can be learned and um, they get professional development credit, which is called a sketch. Uh, and I think there's six left after this evening. And so they could earn six if they learn about it from you. And as you know, we, we, we also live stream through Facebook and then we post all the webinars afterwards. So if, there's, if you wanna look up um, an interesting topic, you're welcome to do so. Um, so these are our remaining talks. Uh, and um, I also want to point out um, at the bottom, so in case you are interested in, the, in, in sharing about our summer youth programs, registration is now open for them. And these will be in-person programs on campus this summer. We've become very good at um, with safety planning and health precautions. So pass this on, um, grandmas and grandpas out there and moms and dads, you might give this um, um, some consideration. It's a really, these are really well done summer youth programs. 
This will be next week's um, uh, webinar speaker, uh, our own Andrew Barnard, who is a mechanical engineering faculty member. Uh, <clears throat> he is also the director of the Great Lakes Research Center. And so he's going to be um, speaking uh, about marine autonomy and fishing. Uh, and I, I'm really looking forward to that. The co-host is Travis White, who is um, not only a research engineer, but he's the relief captain of the Great Lakes Research Center. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing. Um, and so Tim, you go ahead and, and start sharing your screen while I introduce Nia. So my co-host this evening, I'm so delighted to be introducing Nia Sharma, who is a doctoral candidate uh, here at Michigan Tech. Uh, and are you also earning a master's degree here, Nia? Yes, I will be completing my master's degree this semester, but I've already started on my PhD. Yes, so she's, um, She's, she's an alumnus or an alumna soon, uh, chemical engineering class of, of 2021. So um, Nia comes to us, uh, she earned her bachelor of science in mineral processing from in India at the IIT, the very famous IIT. Um, her PhD is focused on iron and manganese extraction through bacterial leaching. And this is also what um, Dr. Isley will be speaking about soon. Um, a few other interesting things about Nia, um, Nia, um, is an artist. She does charcoal sketching uh, as a hobby, and I appreciate that because I like I like I like sketching and drawing too. She likes to read. She likes to play badminton. She she cross country skis, and she is a fan of Lord of the Rings and um, also um, you know a Potterhead. <laughs> so so Nia, thank you so much for joining me as co-host. And remember, if something happens to my internet connection, you are you take over as as co-host and help with the questions. I want to remind the audience that you can type in a question at any point uh, in the, in the, in the, um, in the uh, field that's called Q&A. Uh, and again, thank you everyone for joining us. This is Michigan Tech's um, Husky Bites, a free webinar series um, where we have fun um, while eating supper. Uh, so Nia, go ahead and take it from here. Thanks a lot, Zane. Um, good, good evening, everyone. Today we have here with us Dr. Tim Isley, who will be presenting on backyard metals. He is a Michigan Tech alumnus and he earned his bachelor's and PhD in metallurgical engineering from Michigan Tech in 1991. Um, he started working as an associate professor in the Department of Chemical Engineering at Michigan Tech in 2010. Some of his research areas of interest are particulate processing, chemistry and thermodynamics of metal extraction, oxidative and reductive bioleaching of metals. His research group is strongly focused on mineral processing and metal extraction via sustainable methods. So let's hear more about backyard metals from Dr. Isley. Thank you very much. Can everyone hear me okay? Good. Yeah. Hey, so what basically what I want to talk about today is that I've basically stumbled across a way of extracting metals at a relatively low cost from areas like my backyard. So I wanted to spend a little time talking about how I got started doing this, what exact metals we're talking about, why they're dissolving, and whether there is something useful that we can do with them. So the way that this all got started is about 20 years ago, my wife and I bought a place just outside of town, nice little place, few acres of land, and the water was rusty. And to the, this is not actually a picture of our bathroom, but it's a pretty close approximation. And if you took a glass of water out of the, drain, out of the sink, it would be clear initially, but if you let it stand, it would turn brown about like this. It was really fairly revolting. So we, of course, got a water softener fairly quickly to clear up this problem, but this started the chain of thought of why would this happen? Because iron in the fully oxidized form that we normally see it is not really soluble in water. It shouldn't be dissolving in water, you wouldn't think. So I started looking into this, why was it in the water in the first place? And if it can dissolve, I've been working with dissolving other metals using different, using bacteria, things like copper, and I thought, maybe this could lead to a way to extract iron. So the first clue as to why we had iron is right next to our house, maybe 50 feet down the hill, there's a bog. 
and it's filled with decomposing plant matter, like these decomposing cattails. And the road cuts through the bog, and, and there's a di the ditch beside the road fills with this red mud with a thin oily sheen. And when you scoop it up, this is obviously mostly iron. Looking at this, you would immediately think that this was some sort of industrial spill, but it's not. This is actually a well-known phenomenon. It's called bog iron. And it's actually been known about for as long as people have been making iron. This used to be a very common small scale iron ore. A blacksmith would be able to go out and maybe every couple of months mine a few barrels of this bog iron, bring it back to his shop and smelt it and make his iron objects. And the, the thing is people didn't think a lot about why it formed. All they knew was that it was these relatively small deposits. And so as, it, as time went by and technology improved, bog iron kind of got left behind as we went to the big banded iron formation deposits that are currently mined and feeding ma massive blast furnaces that are 300 feet tall. But this is still there. The bog iron is still a thing that exists. And this brings us to the question of why does this bog iron even form? And is there some way that we could maybe make it form more briskly so that it would be more useful? It turns out what's going on is the decomposing plant matter in the bog is used as food by iron reducing bacteria. And backing up a bit here, living organisms use respiration to drive their metabolisms. And respiration basically comes down to transferring hydrogen ions and electrons. And so when you're digesting an organic material, the organic material is essentially providing electrons. And as long as you have something to take up those electrons, an electron acceptor, you get an electric current through the cells that they can use to drive their metabolism. And aerobic organisms like us, we use oxygen as our, our electron acceptor. So for example, when we're digesting sugars, the sugars give up 24 electrons and they're taken up by oxygen atoms to make carbon dioxide and water. This works fine if you have oxygen. But in a bog, as soon as you get below the surface, it's an expanse of mud. There's no way for oxygen to get down into it. And anything living down there doesn't have access to oxygen to use as an electron acceptor. So if you have big complex molecules like sugars and polysaccharides, they can break those down through a fermentation process to make things like alcohol and carbon dioxide and get a little electron transfer out of that. But if they have simple molecules, they can't do it and they have to have something else to act as an electron acceptor. And that brings us to what are the options for these anaerobic bacteria to use as electron acceptors when they're living down below the surface in a bog. And so the obvious one, of course, is our first line here that is oxygen. And you get a certain amount of voltage relative to a hydrogen electrode from this. In general, these numbers aren't particularly important for now, other than to know that the bigger the number is, the more energy you get. And so the higher this number is, the more desirable this reaction is as an electron acceptor. So oxygen is obviously very desirable because it produces a high voltage. Nitrate is also very desirable. It produces almost as high of a voltage as oxygen does. And nitrates are actually a lot more soluble in water. So they're more likely to dissolve and get down deep where things can actually get at them. The problem is once they get used up, there's usually not a consistent source. Nitrates are kind of deficient in the environment under the normal circumstances. The next candidate is manganese. And now we're starting to get into metals. So the, the manganese is nearly as good as nitrate and converts from the manganese dioxide, which is a form that normally occurs in nature, into uh, divalent manganese, which as we'll see a bit later, is pretty water soluble. And then we get down to iron. Iron isn't quite as good as manganese, but it's better than our other candidates. And it also takes up an electron and goes from the plus three state, which is the, form, the red form that we see on the surface. That's the form that doesn't dissolve. But when you add that electron to it, it converts to the plus two state, which is pale green and is soluble in water. So what's happening in our, at our house is the bacteria are taking organic matter that percolates down from the decomposing plant matter on top. They're digesting it using the Fe3 as an electron acceptor, making Fe2, and that Fe2 dissolves 
and gets into our water. And then when it gets to the surface, either by leaching into the ditch or by coming out of a tap, it hits the air, the oxygen reoxidizes at the plus three form, it loses solubility and drops out of solution. So that's where all that iron staining comes from. That's where the bog iron comes from. And that's why so much of this happens. And this is a little more detail of what's going on. This is a poor bay diagram. Basically all we're doing here is we're plotting pH versus electrochemical potential. So if we come down into the, the lower left-hand corner, that's very acid and very reducing. If we're in the upper left-hand corner, that's very acid and very oxidizing. And so not naturally iron in surface rocks is up in the upper region of this diagram where it says Fe2O3, and that's the insoluble form. And by picking up these electrons, it moves down and becomes Fe2 plus, which as we come down to the pH where it's still remaining soluble, we can see that that can dissolve down to about a pH of 5.5, which is pretty typical for surface waters. This is about the pH of a lot of the water that you see in swamps. So whereas you would have needed pH right around 0.5 to dissolve iron in the plus three state, which is very concentrated, very dangerous acid. In contrast, we can dissolve the Fe2 under conditions that you could bathe in without getting any acid burn. So we can see there's an advantage here to making sure it's in the reduced form if we want to dissolve it. Now, one other point here is I'd done a little work with other types of bacteria and initially did some work with the bacteria that are responsible for the iron reduction. And I found that there's a difference between doing microbial research in the lab and doing applied research in the field. And that is that in order for a lot of these organisms to work properly, they need their community of organisms. They need other organisms to pre-break pre down the, the uh, organic matter into the acetic acid and lactic acid that they need. They need other organisms to produce vitamins and to solubilize minerals. They need other organisms to distract predators away. They, the pure strains didn't grow well. They needed that community of other organisms around them. So I have mostly have been working with communities of bacteria that we're collecting from the bog that work to, are, are known to work together. Because even though I, it's a little vague on just exactly what organisms are present, there isn't, they're, they're, they're able to, to persist without being pushed out by other organisms. And this is going to get really important if we ever try to do it on a very large scale, because it's really impossible to keep, say, a, a 10 acre field isolated from other organisms. Things are going to be getting in from the environment and we're going to need to want to make sure that whatever our environment is, is going to be able to sustain itself. So the first application that occurred to me, obviously, was to use it to extract iron. And ideally, this would be suitable for ores that are hard to process with conventional methods. The conventional iron mining operations are mostly going after magnetite and hematite that can be ground and break pure mineral grains apart from one another. And then you can physically sort them using magnets or froth flotation or other separation processes. But there are a lot of ores where this isn't actually practical because the, the grain size is so tiny. And so we need something that's going to chemically attack the metal to dissolve it. So this ore here is one that, we, that I tested out here. This came from South Africa originally. And this particular ore was extremely finely grained. And if you look at this uh, X-ray map here from the electron microscope, the scale bar is 60 microns, the green is iron, and the blue and the red are silica and alumina. And you can see that there's no segregation between them. They're all blended together at a very fine scale, very submicron. And so it's not really practical to physically separate those. So we were looking at whether the bacteria could chemically separate them. And so our test apparatus was a, a three inch diameter by five foot tall column that was filled with ore that was being continuously fed by water that contained organic matter that the bacteria could use as a source of electrons. This was inoculated with our bog iron. And then we would gradually remove 
the leachate that would have iron dissolved in it. So this is a relatively simple thing to set up. The main thing is just to keep oxygen from getting into it because then the bacteria would use oxygen instead of iron. And so initially we saw that the, the iron content in the water that we were taking out started very low, got up to about 200 parts per million and then leveled off. I'd seen a few other people doing this sort of work in the past and they mostly got to this point, said, oh, this is as high as it's going to get. And it's been 30 days and we've got other things to do with our time and they stopped. I didn't find anybody in the literature who had more than 30 days, but I had nothing better to do with my time. This wasn't a funded project. This was something I was doing out of curiosity. And so I let it run longer. And then after about 60 days, it started increasing iron concentration again. And so I decided to go ahead and let it run. So we ran it for about 420 days. And here we see that this was the part of the graph we were just looking at down at the bottom. And as we got past 60 days, the iron content kept going up and up and up until finally we peaked at right around 1800 parts per million, which is about, uh, about 1.8 grams per liter. This is going to be a significant concentration. So we can see we can get quite a lot of iron in the solution. In fact, this is to the point where electro, electrolytically recovering the iron is starting to look attractive. You might be able to just pass an electric current through it and plate out the metal. And that brought us to my proposed extraction approach for going after the iron. You have a bed of low grade ore that's hard to process. What I'm primarily looking at is things like uh, tailings ponds, because when you mine conventional iron ore, you separate the low grade rock from the high grade rock and the low grade rock goes into a tailings pond for storage. And of course that pond, you want to make sure that you're not leaking into the surroundings. So it's always in an impermeable basin and it's already finely ground. So the iron is accessible. So the concept here is we would inject uh, organic bearing liquid into this uh, ore. The iron reducing bacteria could then use that organics to dissolve the iron. We could bring the iron to the surface, concentrate it to make sure that it's possible to electroplate it out and then electro win it from solution to make pure metallic iron. And I actually did the pure metallic iron in the lab as well. So we, we proved that we can in fact do that. This is a, a small sample of electrolytic iron. And if it's done carefully, this electrolytic iron can be extremely pure, like 99.9% .9 pure iron, which is something you don't get from a blast furnace because blast furnaces tend to put a lot of impurities into the iron, sulfur, carbon, manganese, and the like. So this would be metal that would not need to be further refined. You could use it straight up for alloy. So what's the problem? Say, why, don't I, why aren't I doing this? Why isn't this being licensed out? Well, the big problem is that iron is cheap. Cheap, 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 cheap. It is the cheapest metal by a substantial margin. And so nobody wants to switch to new technology making it unless that new technology is similarly cheap. And I think this technology could be similarly cheap, but I need to prove it. There's several companies that have told me that they'd be interested if I can definitely demonstrate that it could be competitive, but in order to definitely demonstrate to be competitive, somebody needs to fund the research. So it's kind of a catch 22 situation. There is some possibility though that we might not have to go straight for the high grade ore. There are other markets for high purity iron that are separate from the markets for steel. For example, the high purity electrolytic iron is used for making high grade magnetic materials. And it's also used for nutritional supplements. In fact, if you take a magnet and find an iron enriched uh, breakfast cereal, you will find that there is actually tiny particles of iron, actual metallic iron in the cereal. This is fine, by the way. Metallic is non-toxic. It hits your stomach, your stomach acids dissolve it, and it's a bioavailable iron. It is the, one of the best ways to get bioavailable iron into a food, but it's a little startling. You don't normally think of putting actual metal into breakfast cereal. But this brings up another possibility that if I were not an entirely scrupulous person, I could start making this material and start selling it as a nutritional supplement as organic iron, because I'd be producing it organically using bacterial action and no purchased chemicals, and it'd be all very, very nice. However, this is not really the sort of thing that you get a lot of people to invest in and can get going industrially. 
But that brings us to the question is, is iron the only thing that we could use this process, sort of process for? And previously we've mentioned that manganese, the bacteria would actually like more because it gives a better energy yield. And it turns out if we look at the poor bay diagram for manganese, it is if anything better for this process than iron is. Because up here we have the, the MnO2 region up at near the top of the, di the diagram. This is the form where it occurs in rock. And if we reduce it relatively a small amount, we get into Mn2 plus, which is the soluble form. And this will dissolve all the way up to about pH nine. So this becomes significantly more soluble and is much more accessible. So why would manganese be much more attractive? Well, it turns out that first of all, manganese is a class of, one of the class of what's called battery metals. It's a metal that's used heavily for making batteries. Specifically, the single use alkaline batteries that you buy, the Duracells and the Everettis, these are using manganese dioxide as one of their electrodes. They are about 50% manganese dioxide. So they are big users of electrolytic grade manganese. Also, several of the, the lithium ion battery types are also largely manganese based. They are mixing the manganese with other compounds like cobalt and nickel and iron and phosphorus, but they, a lot of them use a significant amount of manganese. And because of this, the Department of Energy is quite interested because more manganese availability and higher grade manganese means that it's less expensive to make batteries and batteries are becoming a dominant part of our electricity mix. Of course, on top of this, it's also a critical outlying element for steel, which is one of the things that keeps the price of manganese as high as it is because most of it actually ends up being used for steel alloy. It turns out that putting manganese in steel basically is a win-win situation almost all steels contain at least some manganese because it improves their properties. So there's a huge market for it as, as steel alloy. In spite of this, in spite of the fact that there's uses for it and it's about $2,000 a ton for the, to buy the manganese oxide, there's no domestic production. Ores exist in the US, but they are not, with the current mining technology, they're not competitive. It turns out that there are some very excellent manganese deposits in Africa that simply are impossible to compete with with existing dig, uh, separate, mechanically separate and smelt technologies like we currently use. So I'm hoping that this approach would be a possible way to get at the lower grade ores without having to move a lot of rock, without having to do any of the sorting, without any of the things that makes our ores non-competitive relative to the African ores. And it turns out also that I can do this research with local materials. You probably heard of Lake Manganese up, until, up near Copper Harbor. This is aptly named. There is in fact a manganese deposit just, be, just south of Lake Fannyhoo. And this was discovered by Douglas Houghton back in the 1830s and they contemplated mining it back in the 1880s to the point where they actually excavated a, a few hundred uh, tons of it did testing and assay and ultimately decided it wasn't quite a big enough deposit at quite a high enough grade to be worthwhile, but it was a near thing. So there is still that ore body there. And I was able to locate it through the MINDAT site. So if you go to mindat.org location 3852, you'll get this map and it'll show you exactly where it is. And if you go there, you can still see the remains of the exploration trench where they dug it out. And you find these black electrically conductive rocks, which are manganese dioxide. So we actually have something available that I can use as an actual ore for evaluating this process. So for the manganese, the concept is similar to what we have for the iron, except in this case, we don't have to make it into metal. The big market for the manganese is as the battery market, and the battery market wants manganese dioxide. So all we need to do is dissolve it, bring it to the surface, and then uh, bubble oxygen through the solution to reoxidize it to manganese dioxide. It's now not soluble, drops out of solution. We recirculate our solution back to our wetland and dissolve more manganese. 
And again, we have the case where we have a, our low grade ore body. We just establish a wetland on top. We grow cattails or similar plants on it. So all of our necessary reagents are being made on the spot. It's indistinguishable from a regular wetland, aside from the fact there's a few pipes coming out of it. If this was done carefully, I suspect it would, we could do it without it even really being clear that any mining was going on at all. We could have ducks and wildlife frolicking about as normal and would be totally unaffected by what we were doing 30 or 40 feet underground. And even if the water did percolate out of the region it's in, manganese is not toxic to any great extent. The solution, the materials in the water are all coming from decomposing materials, so they're normally present. They're not toxic, so it's not like we would be putting toxic chemicals into the environment. We simply be taking advantage of a natural process to dissolve manganese and bring it out to where we can use it. So we actually did receive a grant from the Department of Energy to investigate this further. It was just it just started in January, and so we have our leaching vessels in the laboratory where we're at the moment evaluating which conditions of pH and growth media and time and which types of ore will leach most readily. So we're running our little leach vessels as if they were uh, bog deposits. We're injecting anaerobic solutions into it. We have tanks of decomposing plant matter that we're using as nutrient media to feed it. And we're getting significant amounts of manganese dissolving in the water. So this is looking good and I think we're going to get somewhere. Again, it's early days yet, but we'll hopefully be writing this up fairly soon as technical papers, and maybe we'll even get viable processes that somebody can do on a pilot scale within the next couple of years. So in conclusion, there's lots of effects going on that can dissolve metals and get them accessible in the environment. And in particular, they happen in anaerobic environments where they're going to mobilize the metals, whether we do it, do it intentionally or not. And so by rearranging things, we can make it so that it will give us the metal in the process. And at the very least, we can get both iron and manganese this way. There's a few other metals that are potentially of interest, mostly things that tend to associate with manganese, but iron and manganese are the big ones. The iron is probably more of a long-term thing because in the long run, the iron industry is going to need to stop burning coal. And this would be a way to get iron without having to use any fossil fuels. So it probably may not happen in our lifetimes, but we'll set the groundwork so that when it becomes necessary, we will be able to make iron in quantity without having to use coal. And in the short term, we can recover manganese from low grade ores with minimal environmental damage, pretty much anywhere that we happen to need it. And this would be a great benefit to the battery industry because now we'll be able to make our batteries domestically instead of having the chance of being cut off by some other country who decides that they'd rather sell it to someone else. So that's pretty much the end of my talk. So I see there's a few Excellent. Uh, questions. Well, so, well, so Tim, first of all, just thank you. I'm, I was utterly fascinated by this. I, and I um, it made me <clears throat> feel like I brought all my material science and chemical engineering knowledge, you know, like I understand this. And so it was. And, and now you also know why your sinks get rusty. <laughs> <laughs> I know why my sinks get rusty, yeah. No, thank you so much. And so, um, yeah, maybe um, while we, so people, you can ask questions in the Q&A and I, and I can see we already have 10 questions in the Q&A, but I'm gonna go ahead and ask Nia a question at first. So Nia, how does your research fit in here? I am doing the manganese uh, leaching and extraction process. Uh, the leaching class setup that you saw in Dr. Isley's presentation slides. So I'm working on those vessels and we are taking out samples from the leaching flask and we are analyzing them for manganese. Uh, so yeah, that's what I'm doing. All right, and I'm having a coughing fit. So um, Nia, and Tim, maybe you can select some questions. Okay. Yeah. So the first question was, is there a prevalence for iron four in surface waters? Uh, actually, iron only usually oxidizes to the plus three state. And once it does that, it is almost completely insoluble. So in, in oxidized water, iron really doesn't dissolve. 
which was why it was surprising to find it in tap water. Okay, so the second question, if we could detect various metals on dry land, such as the surface of Mars, could we then predict if that land was previously underwater? So Janet, did you want to answer? It just says Janet Callahan would like to answer this question live. All right, so I um, I won't be able to answer that question, um, but you mm -hmm. you can. So when okay. I when I when I it, it's a way to help me archive okay. the questions after we okay. answer them. Yeah. All right. So on Mars, there's no oxygen in the air, so the the iron isn't necessarily fully oxidized. So those, since Mars is red, obviously most of it is. So, but yeah, if, if we found areas on Mars where there was sediments that had a lot of reduced metal, that would tend to imply that it had been underwater and that there had been organic matter. But that would also imply a life, which would get people excited for other reasons and they probably would lose interest in the iron fairly quickly. <laughs> well, and I, I see there's some comments about bicycle riding. So in the, in the sort of pre-show, we were talking about biking. Uh, and so Paul mentioned that uh, in Fort Wayne, Indiana, it was 60 degrees last week and he rode 30 miles. So that, that's really good. And so Nia, you need to talk louder so people can hear you, okay? Yeah. <laughs> so shout, no. <laughs> okay. Okay. So there was a question of whether the uh, thing keeps scrolling off my page. This sounds like it might be related to the corrosion of freshwater steel that occurs beyond the Lake Superior harbors. Yes, actually, these bacteria are known for causing metal corrosion. In fact, I had driven some fence posts into our bog to build an electric fence around some beehives that I had down there at the time. And those posts corroded at the waterline almost instantly. So these bacteria, if they get access to metallic iron and oxygen, they will destroy iron very quickly. <clears throat> Tim, was that the question by Eric that you just yes. answered? Yes. Okay. I, got, I can hardly keep up with you. You're going so fast here. Okay, I will slow down. There we go. No, it's good. Um, <laughs> okay, so the next question is from Paul Jones. Can this leaching phenomenon be used to address iron ochre, which tends to exist in clay-based soil and clogs tile-based drainage systems? Maybe. That, I mean, the, 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 the iron ochre is the iron hydroxide, which is the plus three form that precipitates out. And if we exclude oxygen, we could redissolve it. So it might take a little time and it might smell kind of bad because the organic matter that we're putting in the water is basically decomposing <clears throat> plant matter. But yeah, we might be able to use that to clear things out. Okay, and Becky Castle. Asks, is there an environmental danger to the use of bacteria? These particular bacteria, I don't think so because they are naturally are occurring in that environment and they are not pathogenic. And they're, the only things that are really dissolving are iron and manganese. Other metals, the more toxic metals, they tend to dissolve when they're oxidized and precipitate when they're reduced. So these metal reducing bacteria will tend to precipitate everything but iron and manganese. So if there were, say, uh, cadmium in the water, the bacteria would tend to precipitate that out instead of dissolving it. So if anything, I think they might be useful for clearing out heavy metal contaminations. <clears throat> All right, and this question's for Nia. Uh, how did you decide to come to Michigan Tech? And then how did you find Dr. Isley as your PhD advisor? And then uh, if, there's one more question after that, but um, go ahead and answer those first two. Well, uh, I'm always interested in higher studies. So I started by finding universities which were focused on the research areas that I was interested in. Basically in India, you don't find a market for sustainable research. Like what the iron industry is just coal and iron and nobody's looking towards factory and such things. There may be like in the coming 10 or 15 years, they might be looking into it. But right now we have a lot of coal, so that does make sense. So that is why I wanted to come here to, you know, grab the technology that will be used in 10 to 15 years. And Dr. Isley's research was a lot relevant to what I wanted to do. So initially I contacted a few professors and I just decided to come to Michigan Tech because it was so beautiful. <laughs> it certainly is. 
<clears throat> and so, Tim, this is, a, I guess, the question for you. Is there room in your group for more researchers? Um, to a point. I mean, I have room for undergraduate researchers and I have room for hourly graduate students, but currently the I've, I've committed to the number of uh, grad, full-time graduate students that my project, current project can support. So I'm limited by how much money is available. But if somebody wanted to come- If there were infinite money available, yeah, I could use many people. Or if they were, or if they were self, self-funded, self right? Yeah. If they were self-funded. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, no, it's a, it's a fascinating area. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've, I'm absolutely fascinated by this. Yeah. <clears throat> All right, and so Eric asks or comments, he says, the direct reduction iron process using natural gas is in position to replace the blast furnace process. A full scale model plant is under construction in the Toledo area, or, or sorry, a yes. full scale plant. Yes, yes, this is in fact true. And th this is actually something that I bring up in my uh, hydrometallurgy and pyrometallurgy class that the blast furnace is 100 year old technology. And it's still basically done the same way it was done in the 1800s. And because of the, the nature of the furnace, it's, it's inflexible. It has to be built at a very large scale in order to be economic. Once you start them, you can't stop, which makes it hard to adapt to prevailing market conditions. And so there's a lot of interest in ways to make iron without using a blast furnace. And the, the natural gas direct reduction method, it doesn't use coal, it uses natural gas instead. It can be made smaller. You can turn it on and off relatively quickly. You can scale it to whatever size you want. The only problem with it is it takes a higher grade ore than the blast furnace does. And so you can't just use any ore in the uh, uh, natural gas direct reduction process. But that's another poss possibility for the bacterial leaching. I should be able to produce a very high grade bog iron product that might be more suitable for the natural gas reduction than the uh, conventionally mined iron ore pellets are. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> no, I, I keep, I'm, I'm just imagining all the cranberry bogs, you know, now being used to extract, you know, manganese and iron and huh. stuff. Um, all right, so Scott just makes a comment um, that he's coming up uh, on a visit to Michigan Tech in a couple of weeks. So Scott, I'm assuming you're a prospective student. So I encourage you, um, if you would like to meet with me, just send me an email. If you would like to, you know, meet with one of the chairs of, of, of the degree program you're interested in, just just um, feel free to reach out on your own. I mean, just drop them an email, look them up and drop them an email. And, uh, yeah. and uh, I hope in a couple of weeks, we'll still be way behind the, the, snow, the snow thermometer. So I looked it up folks. We're at 131.3 inches, <clears throat> and the average over the last five years for mid-March is 172 inches. So we are 41 inches behind. <laughs> I don't think we're ever going to catch up, but Tim is pretty sure we're going to get a we're going to get another blizzard. <clears throat> and normally it happens around April 15th to April 22nd. Well, so Chelsea asks, are the bacteria in other locations significantly different to where this process would be ideal in some bogs, but not in others? That is one of the things we need to find out because it's quite likely that you get different bacterial assemblages in different areas. Some of them may be better at dissolving iron and manganese than others. The, these bacteria were only even discovered to exist back around 1988. And uh, the last time I sent some in for a DNA analysis to try to identify the species, they came back as 80% unknown. Oh, interesting. So, so these are undescribed organisms for the most part. Wow. So, which makes sense when you think about it. It's how many billions of species of bacteria are there in the world and how, what tiny fraction of them have actually been examined. So every time, if you, if you want to have species of something named after you or you want to name them after somebody, go into bacteriology, you will find things. <laughs> All right, Tim, here's a, here's a, a question. <clears throat> I know you covered this, but maybe you could go over it again. How does bacteria get the oxygen away from the manganese? They appar apparently, they actually have little bio wires that connect up to the surface and conduct electrons into the metal. And once the electron is injected, the oxygen lets go and reacts with uh, hydrogen ions in the water to make hydroxyl. And 
dissolves. Fascinating. So they've, they've done, so these bacteria are the same type of bacteria that are being used for uh, microbial batteries or microbial fuel cells, I guess they're, they're called, where you're actually using these bacteria to transfer electrons and develop a voltage. And they, have, they can run wires that are considerably longer than the actual bacterial, bacterial cell that are made of cell mass and conduct significant amounts of electricity that way. So it's, it's a fairly fascinating area to getting down to the, how they actually do this, that they can, they can access iron, metal oxides that are quite a ways away from the actual cell. No, I, I didn't even think about the mechanism by the, by the electron being transferred. That's fascinating. Yeah. All right, Zach, um, I think has taken a class with you. Um, yes. Zach Boyden says something from your 4,000 level course in hydropyro was the prevalent use of cyanide leaching for gold ore on pads. If I yeah. understand correctly, are you saying your proposal is an organic leaching pad using microbes instead of cyanide and manganese mm. iron instead yeah. of gold. Yeah, basically, yes. It's, it's another leaching process. Mm -hmm. We have a mass of permeable ore. We're passing a solution through it. We're setting up conditions where the metals that we want dissolve and other metals do not. If when we're doing it with gold, you'd use cyanide or uh, thiosulfate or thiourea to dissolve the metal. In this case, we're using metal reducing bacteria to dissolve the metal, but mechanically it looks similar. It's just the chemistry that's different. Well, and an anonymous attendee says gold, how do we invest in this new adventure? <laughs> <laughs> well, this isn't actually getting any gold. <laughs> well, and so um, I just want to kind of give some background. Jeffrey Hines asked, does Michigan Tech offer a degree in metallurgical engineering? And so <clears throat> I'll, I'll Take a stab at answering that. So I know. So so don't Tim, you have a degree in so in metal. Th there's still the material science department, which was what the metallurgy department became. They you can still learn about metallurgy in the material science department. It's just that your diploma no longer says metallurgical engineering. A and this department has a strong historical emphasis yes. in metallurgy, right? Yes. And so there's there's a lot of expertise in in, yes. in metallurgy here. Yeah, so the material science department still does a lot of metal, direct metals work. They have a foundry, a fully functional foundry. And so if, if you wanted to study metallurgy, this would be a good place to do it. Certainly, certainly. Well, and so, so Nea, when, how long have you been here studying? Is this your second year here now? Yeah, this is my second year. And my last semester for master's, so I'm almost completing my two years here. Very good. And of course, no one is promising you'll be done in three years or anything like that, right? <laughs> I'm here for a long time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, a typical PhD is sort of in the three to four year kind of, you know, mm -hmm. time frame. And it's, yeah. I remember my advisor telling me, you'll, you know, it, we'll all know when you're done, Janet, you know, because mm -hmm. you'll have, you know, it's sort of, you sort of end up with yeah. these nice studies and then, mm -hmm. It tells us the story. Yeah. All right. So Chelsea asks, and feel free, Nia, go ahead and pick up the question after this one. So Chelsea asks, would this impact the quality or health of the plants living within the bogs by removing manganese or iron causing, causing deficiencies? I don't believe it would. I mean, they're, they're, we're dissolving excess metals they don't they require manganese and iron but they don't require anything like that quantity and so the the metal that we're removing is well in excess of what they actually need they they're more in need of uh, things like phosphorus and nitrates and potassium and uh, manganese and the the more macronutrient compounds but the, these are well iron and manganese are both well down in the micronutrient range as long as there's some available they'll be fine So Grigori has a question. Uh, could the iron leaching apparatus be used to purify water for a home or does it not produce enough iron reduced water? Um, it's kind of the opposite of purifying water for a home. You're, you're putting iron into the water not so much taking it out. 
Um, a water softener actually pulls iron out of the water very effectively. And also at the time we bought our water softener, there was another device that would actually oxidize the iron and precipitate it out and filter it from the solution. So you can either use an oxidative, oxidative iron removal device or a water softener to remove the metals. All right, we're gonna take the two questions from John Soyring next. And Nia, go ahead and pick up the next question. So John asks, is this process applicable to extracting lithium or cobalt? And that's the first question he has. Lithium, probably not, cobalt maybe. Okay. And then um, he's curious about approximately how much electrical energy in kilowatt hours, if you have it, is required to extract a kilogram of manganese. Um, I don't remember the number off the top of my head. I did calculate it out for my proposal. And it's, it's fairly negligible because we're, we're not actually electrolytically precipitating the manganese. So we just need enough power to run pumps to circulate water. Right. And, and so it, it ended up being on the order of pennies per kilogram for the circulation cost. Okay, so if I'm not wrong, this is Dr. Pradeep on the run. And she asked, like, uh, anaerobic leaching brought 1,800 ppm iron in 14 months. I have two questions. To what extent is the transport effect responsible for this low leaching process? And what fraction of the total iron was recovered when it reached 1,800 ppm? So probably the uh, slow leaching was mainly because of, like you say, transport. It was relatively coarsely crushed rock. And so it would have only been dissolving on the surface and trying to work into the middle. And the fraction of total iron recovered was probably on the order of maybe 1% in that amount of time. But it was, it was still dissolving at the same rate. I could have continued at that rate for probably indefinitely. So what I'm actually envisioning for this is not a case where we go in, leach all the metal in two years, and then move on. It's more set up a farming operation and we'd harvest metal reg on a regular basis for decades. And so mm. it, this would be a very long term sort of process. Well, it's kind of like putting up a wind farm on your farm, mm -hmm. right? You could actually right. have um, some of the some of the, some of the wet, mushy land that isn't too mm -hmm. good for other things. Mm -hmm. You could set up something like this. Um, um, very, very interesting. Mm -hmm. Nia, do you see another question? You're going to have to really yeah. talk loud. Talk loud now. <laughs> well, I looked at my settings. They're all fine. I don't know why the volume is so low. Yeah. Well, there's something about your microphone that you're quiet, and then you're loud, then you're quiet, then you're loud. That's all. <laughs> I think I need to buy a new headset. Yeah. So Paul has a question. Uh, the iron process you described takes years. Can it really be feasible on a large scale, or would it be a batch, or could it be a continuous flow through process? So I, I'm, I think that it would actually work better on a very large scale because then you'd be able to collect uh, water from a large area so that even though it's slowly dissolving in any given spot, you'd be able to concentrate it into your recovery unit. So I think it probably is more, more scalable than not. It it's probably would be more economical at a larger scale than at a smaller scale. Although the, the actual surface facility is pretty simple. And so it might be doable on a small scale simply because you don't have to put a lot of capital investment into the surface facility. So this question is from an anonymous attendee. Uh, uh, and so it's to Dr. Isley. Do you imagine ever using this method to clean up the environment and remove other toxic metals? Maybe it's quite possible that we could use this to clean up acid mine runoff uh, from uh, sulfide mines. We might be able to recover useful materials from that and get it out of the water. So yeah, the, basically any time that we have finely divided iron mixed with other things, we could potentially use this to recover it and separate it from whatever contaminants might be mixed with. Also somewhat related to this, if you have iron in the plus two state dissolved in the water, and then you oxidize it to make the iron 
hydroxide precipitates, that's been found to be really effective for grabbing other ions from solution. And so you could use it as a way of settling out other metals that might be dissolved. So yes, it, it could possibly be part of an environmental cleanup operation. <clears throat> All right, and so um, Leah, go ahead and pick the question. I'm just gonna take this, this one first. Uh, and so it's another question about what major or degrees at Michigan Tech enable a student to obtain expertise in metallurgy. So we, we already answered this. I just want to mention mm -hmm. a few more things. So the, the bachelor's degree to pursue, if you really like metallurgy, would be called materials science and engineering. Um, that In that field, you can also, you can specialize in metallurgy in your career by working you know, for companies where your metallurgical expertise is needed. You can also go into ceramic engineering. You, you, know, you, you, know, you could work on composites. You know, everything is made of something. So that field is really focused on um, the processing of materials in order to get the properties that you want because, and those properties are, are always related back to the structure of the materials, right? And, the, and things like, like Tim was talking about tonight, so another, another field of great interest um, relative to this would be chemical engineering. So if, if you liked this, thinking about the, the extraction and the process of, of making these materials, um, whenever any sort of process like that happens, it often involves the liquid state and that's what chemical engineers do. We think about how, you know, how, to, how, to, how to do this on a large scale, you know, how to, how to, how to, um, how to I mean, this is a novel approach, right? This is a, how, how can we sustainably produce, um, you know, really important metals for batteries um, without harming the environment? I mean, so if this is interesting to you, I would recommend those two majors um, to, to, to start your degree in. Uh, and remember, you can always change your major. Um, Michigan Tech is the best place to go because your first year of coursework is pretty much the same nearly across all engineering disciplines. Mm -hmm. So you haven't really wasted time by starting off in material science and mm -hmm. switching to chemical engineering or vice versa. Uh, and my course in hydrometallurgy and pyrometallurgy is co-listed in both the chemical engineering department and the materials department. So it would count for credit in either of them. Well, and, and Michael does point out that the, the old degree of mineral processing Though that expertise um, did move into chemical engineering, and there, there's a lot of there's a lot of collaboration between those departments for sure. All right, Nia, a question that you pick. Yeah, so Zach has a question. IRB, as you stated, requires anaerobic conditions to get to work. Do you have plans for using low nutrient or acid-related bacteria to drive oxygen levels down for optimal IRB conditions? Yeah, so that, that's basically the, the design for the, the bog, the synthetic bog, that's exactly what it's doing. The decomposing plant matter on the top is using up the oxygen in the water. So aerobic decomposition on the surface will make sure that as the water percolates down, its oxygen will be used up. And by the time it gets through that decomposing organic layer, it will have a lot of organic molecules and no dissolved iron, no dissolved oxygen. And also, It'll, that uh, aerobic decomposition generates organic acids that help in the dissolution to keep the pH in the range we would like. Very good. <clears throat> All right. Um, well, and so this is a question for Nia. And Nia, I just don't understand because your mic is soft and then it's loud and it's soft. So just try being really loud across your answer for this. So Nia, what type of work do you hope to do once you've received your Michigan Tech PhD? Well, I always have the option of becoming a professor, but I am really looking forward to look for industries and work for projects for them. So yeah, that is what I'm interested in because right now I'm not ready to settle for being a professor. So mm -hmm. there's always <laughs> industries who will hire you and because yeah. of having a PhD degree, you can expect uh, role that describes like you have a project and you control everything in the project. So that is what I'm looking forward to. Very good. And if this project goes really well, you may be able to do it as a business. You could start That's your own right. company. <laughs> 
Well, and so we're, we'll take the question from Scott. Um, can bog iron be melted and used commercially or is it just a byproduct? And so yeah. I was curious, you had mentioned that, you know, in the yeah. old days, yeah. you know, blacksmiths would make iron out of by, out yes. of peat it, moss it, or something? It, it is a perfectly fine iron ore. You, it's a high grade, if you collect it carefully, it's a high grade ore, it doesn't have a lot of silicates in it. You can heat, heat it up to drive off the moisture. And once it's dry, you can put it into a, a small smelting furnace and smelt it and make your iron bloom and put it on your anvil and hammer it out and make your wrought iron. So yes, it is definitely something you can use directly to make iron, especially if you're a, a medieval recreation enthusiast. <laughs> what does bog iron look like? I mean, if, if we saw it on a, in a, well, the, in a those, bog. those pictures that I had earlier, though, that red mud that was in the palm of my hand, that's bog iron. It's okay. actually iron hydroxide. Very cool. All right, did we answer the question from Harry yet about um, at the top? About the iron, manganese and cobalt in batteries? Yeah. Yeah, that, that's all true. The manganese and cobalt may allow you to have better energy density and as long as the, the problem is getting the energy density without the risk of fire there and the manganese cobalt nickel composition is stable enough that it's less likely to spontaneously burst into flame than it would be if you didn't have the cobalt in it. So that, that's why they use that mixture of metals because any one of them in principle could work. We could just use manganese by itself, except that there would be deformations during the charging cycle that would be likely to cause it to get catch fire. At least that's my understanding. So the, the trick with the lithium ion batteries is that they are putting a lot of energy into a very small space and any cracks or dendrite growth that shorts it out is likely to cause it to burst into flame. All right, and so Catherine just comments, she's heard great things about the hydro pyro class from current students. And so what's the course number for this in case we have students uh, listening? CM 4740 or MSC 4740. All right, put that it's on a, your list, folks. It's a, it's a four credit course offered in the spring. And I try to cover extraction of probably 90% of the elements on the periodic table before the class ends. <laughs> All right, so we got one question left, and then I would like just some closing remarks from from Nia, and then Tim, you can you can kind of close mm -hmm. us down. And yeah. so, um, uh, so this last question from Michael Gregory is: Doesn't Michigan Tech have one of the few unit operations labs in the nation? I think this is one reason the new department mm -hmm. had left Georgia Tech to come to Michigan Tech, mm -hmm. which is true. Yeah. This is pretty baggerwell. A huge plus for students to get hands-on experience. Do you want to just comment a little bit about, about that, Tim? Yeah, it's a really excellent facility because things are at the scale that are roughly comparable to what you'd see once you get out in the, into the world. And we actually, it's, it's not up and running yet, but we're, we're working on getting a, a solvent extraction electro-winning uh, circuit that mimics what they do for copper recovery in the unit operations lab. Hopefully that'll be something we can actually get ready for the students to use in the fairly near future. Yeah, no, we have an absolutely tremendous um, kind of, um, you've got to come here to see it. I mean, it's, it is, I have, I am, I've, a, I've visited more than 20 different universities, um, often looking at the chemical engineering departments from an evaluation perspective, and I've never seen anything like the equipment we've got here at Michigan yes. Tech. It's, it's absolutely phenomenal. Yeah, our, our previous department chair said one day, this is our biggest selling point. Why do we have it locked in a room that nobody can see? Let's put a window in the wall so the tour groups can see it. And now it's become a, a centerpiece of the campus tours. So no, it is, it, it's over <laughs> three three stories high. I mean, it's a it's a it's it's phenomenal. Um, so I want to um, just take a minute to thank our speakers and uh, thank you, Nia, for co-hosting with me. Thank you, Tim. Uh, Nia, mm -hmm. I wish you the very best with your PhD research. I think you thank picked you a really so cool topic, a really um, timely topic. Um, a sustainable topic. I'm, I'm really, really pleased. And, and Tim, I learned so much. I, I really, really enjoyed your talk. Um, you. Remember, folks, these are weekly webinars, uh, and uh, it has been wonderful to be joining you every Monday evening. Um, you have been, this is Michigan Tech's College of Engineering Husky Bite series. And so um, some closing remarks from you, Neha. I saw a few questions about uh, pursuing degrees at Michigan Tech. From my experience, I can say that 
no matter which major you're choosing you can always look at subjects that you want to do here and that is particularly go- particularly going to be what you want to do next so if you're interested in metallurgy you can uh, pursue a degree in material science and then focus your subjects in metallurgical extraction metal extractions and such and this is a very nice university and i did not know a lot about michigan tech when i came here but i have like i really love this university so and thanks for having me on husky bite and really thanks to all the audience of course all right tim you want to wrap us up here hey well so thanks everybody for coming to hear me yammer on i was kind of startled to see how many people come it's kind of really flattering i, I hope it was worth it for you and well and i, I guess one other topic is we were talking about one kind of bugs, the bacterial bugs, but if you want to know what other kind of bugs live in the area, I have a web page where I've been photographing bugs for the, ever since 2007. Well, so. and, and I, I so, so, so Tim, can you, can you put the, um, well, tell us, tell us out loud the website, and then um, so I want you to, I want you to close it out by turning yourself into your spider picture. So. <laughs> okay, so the, the website name is something's crawling in my hair.com. Something's and, crawling in my hair. Yes, all, all strung together as one word. And okay. the, the actual title of the, the page is the Backyard Arthropod Project. And it has pictures of things that mostly that I found in my backyard. And so it, if you're living in the Houghton area and you have any interest in what sort of crawling things might be in your yard, there's a good chance I have a picture of them. And something's crawling. All right, then it's been, it's been posted. And here's in the, in the... one of the pictures that I took <laughs> of a charming little fellow that happened to be in our house some years ago. <laughs> <laughs> and Tim's daughters bring him all the all the spiders they find in the house or outside, and and uh, they're they're completely unafraid of bugs, which is mm-hmm. awesome. I think it's great. Why should we be afraid of spiders? <laughs> <laughs> well, not this one. Look how cute he is. <laughs> it's really cute. Well, thanks, everybody. Um, it's been wonderful to spend the evening together, and uh, we'll see you guys next week. Thank you again, Nia and Tim. Thank you. Thank you.